Open your Bibles and listen. If you don't have a Bible, please let myself or Pastor Gary or Miss Lisa or Mark know because we want to put the Word of God into your hands because God changes lives and that only comes with the renewing of our mind. And so we just want to do that. We'll buy that for you as a gift in Jesus' name. We are in 1 John, which is in the back of your Bibles, okay? And we just went through... Okay, oh, I got to tell you something else. Miss Neely, I got to tell you, I don't know if we're going to make it all the way to 7 and 8. First John chapter 4. So I'm just saying you might have to sing that same song again next week because... If it was verse 1 or 2. Verse 1 or 2, we would have made it. But but there, God's word is so rich. We're going to probably go through First John chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. It's probably all we're going to get to today. But if you remember from last week where we left off, we talked about how uh, they gave us, God gave us a love test in 1 John to see where we're at really with the Lord and that we're not merely to love others with words uh, or but with actions and truth, God's word says. And, and his word says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, and it's in verse 19, it says that our actions will show that we belong to the proof, uh, to the truth, so we'll be confident when we stand before God. And so when God says in the end of 1 John chapter 3 that that whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. So even when we're having feelings, whether it's condemnations in our own mind, like we're unworthy, we're not good enough, we can't do it, we're, we're the, you know... We're the one, you know, we're the one of God's kids that just, re we're the real loser. We really stink. Whether our minds are telling us this or, or the enemy has put lies in our minds and our heads saying we, we're not this, we're unworthy, we're unloved, we're uncared for, whatever the enemy has put in your head, those lies that he's put there, whenever our hearts condemn us like that, God is greater than our hearts. Praise and praise God for that is right. And whether it's your mind accusing you or the accuser of the brethren who is happy just to fill you with condemnation you can throw that out the door because he's been hurled down we want to learn to discern say it with me again learn to discern the difference between the conviction of God which leads to life and it's specific and it's to help you it's to rescue you it's that helping hand out of that muck in the mire to the enemy's condemnation our own mind's condemnation which is basically going to lead to despair and to death and to, and to like a prison and it's usually just a blanket statement and so we have to learn to discern the difference between God's conviction by the Holy Spirit and the enemy's condemnation because it, God's word says that he didn't send his son into this world to condemn it but to save the world through him it's his hand he's sending you a life preserver he's sending you a lifeline is what he's doing in any situation he's not here to, to, to jump on you to step on you with cleats He's here to rescue you from your sin. And remember that whoever believes in him is not condemned. And that means right now. Because the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 8, therefore there is now how much condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? No condemnation. Now here's the deal. You have It says it on the page. It says it in the word of God. It says it inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe it in your heart? Because that's where the change, there is how much condemnation? No. No. Right now. Right now. Noon in the Greek. Presently. In your life. If you are in Christ Jesus, any of those condemning thoughts, you can set them aside because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay? There might be conviction, but that's only because he loves you and to help you. Okay? And even if we feel guilty, 1 John 3.20 said, God is greater than our feelings because he knows everything. And because of that blood of Jesus Christ, and I, some people got freaked out by this, but it, when you think of it, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Because of that, we can have confidence before the Lord. We can go boldly before the throne. And through faith in him, we can approach him with confidence. And we can ask whatever we, whatever we want according to his will. Will. This is not to get what you want done on earth. This is to get his will done on earth. Okay. According to his will, it says he hears us. And whatever we ask, it shall be done for us. Because our desires, when we're lining up our will with his will, 
we'll be thinking about God what do you want here and whatever his will is will be done we talked about doing what we do to please the Lord and that the real work of God is simply this the real work is to believe in the one whom God has sent and that's Jesus Christ that's the real work we talked about the love of God and how because God is love the love of God should just take root in us and grow and push out all that hatred, all that whatever, all that junk, all that despair, all that bitterness, all that anger. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, fill us with your love. Help your love to grow in me, in us, so that it just takes up every fiber of our body. That everything we do is in love, even if it's the difficult stuff. Because God is love. And we ended with the fruit of the Holy Spirit being in us, being saved. Saved, if we have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, these things are going to grow. Just like you would see an apple on an apple tree, you're going to see the love of God in your life. You're going to see the joy of God in hard situations, the peace of God. You get it, the, 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 the kindness of God, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and the self-control. People don't like to talk about that, but that's part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when we finish 1 John, this is basically in, when we look back, when our conscience accusing us is accusing us, we look back and we say, okay, why is that? Is it, is it of me? Do I have an overactive conscience? Or is it, is it possibly the enemy that's condemning me? Or is it the Holy Spirit that's convicting me? So whenever we're, our heart accuses us or whatever, we have to look back and we have to pray and ask the Lord, why is that happening? If it's something that's of the Lord, then we need to change it. If it's something of the enemy we need to reject it we also need to look ahead when our heart affirms us we need to excuse me we need to uh, look around when our heart affirms us and and see why and and when our hearts going when the Holy Spirit's crying or our hearts going yeah you did the right thing it's gonna line up with God's Word and so you want to say oh yes that does please the Lord that is what we want to do so when our heart affirms us we want to pray and say God why is that and and see why that that is so we can continue to do that and then finally we need to look within um, when the Holy Spirit assures us, okay, we need to look in because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we need to look up realizing that it's only because of God. We're being assured because of the Holy Spirit, His goodness, His grace, His truth, His mercy within us, and we need to praise Him and thank Him because you know what? We're a child of God, of all the people. Like, okay, maybe I can see you being a child of God or you being a child of God, but I'm thinking, He chose me? What a knucklehead. What a wretch. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He saved a wretch like me. They should make that into a song. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now we're going to read together uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And we go through the Word of God here, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm being just... I, I, I don't know if I'm beating a dead horse or if this is just in my head, but it, it scares me. It scares me that it, it's, it's almost like I, I love cheery people and I love cheery churches. That's great. We should have the joy of the Lord. But you know what? This isn't this isn't a, a, a cheer session. I'm not up here to go rah rah sis boom ba follow Jesus ha ha ha. Do you, you know what I mean? I, that's that's nice for the minute, but that's not going to last. We need something more substantial. We need roots to go down deep in the Word of God. We don't need a cheer session. I mean, that's good. I'm happy. I want you to be encouraged coming here. Don't get me wrong, okay? Every one of you. But you know what? Sometimes I need you to be convicted because that's what God wants to do. Sometimes I need, he, we need the surgery. Sometimes He wants to empower us, strengthen us. Sometimes He wants to challenge us, stretch us. Whatever it is, it's according to God's Word. That means we have to talk about the tough things as well as... We need to talk about the things that are, oh, just nice and happy and encouraging. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and I already see a hand up, and so I don't know where my mic is. Yeah, there we go. So uh, we do allow questions or comments. Nehemiah, thank you. Would you go bring that to uh, Mr. Mark? He has a quick comment. And then uh, we'll start.
and first John. Before we move on, I, I want everybody to look at number three again. Look within. When the Holy Spirit assures you, look it up. Look it up in the Word of God for yourself. Own it by reading it, internalizing it, asking the Lord to reveal to you what it means in your life right now with the circumstance that you're facing. Look it up. Yeah. Praise God and know why. Thank you. All right, so 1 John chapter 4, not the Gospel of John, 1 John chapter 4, it starts off, dear friends, or some translations that I, in my Bible, some I like a little better, says, might say beloved, it says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses or acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which, excuse me, this is the spirit of Antichrist, I just lost my place, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Verse 4 continues on. You, dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They, on the other hand, are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So Lord Jesus, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our minds, to grant us understanding. Each person here in the name of Jesus, grant our minds understanding, grant our hearts receive hearts, Lord, fertile ground by the power of your Holy Spirit. Anoint my words. May your seeds go through and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 times in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, so after in the, the last part in verse 3, he was telling us, uh, sorry, last part of chapter 3, he was talking about the Holy Spirit that he gave us. And and, and the first thing that we need to know is, as we go into chapter 4, you know, is that I see a lot of Christians, and, and, and even Christians that have been around for a long time, they, once they realize, oh my gosh, this whole spiritual realm thing is a real deal. Th this whole supernatural, this is real. Yeah. It's not just words on a page. It's not just, oh, we come here, we sing songs, I, you know, preach from this book here, and we all go home and live the way we want. When there when we see, when we understand that there's a life-changing power that comes from knowing Jesus, from following him, then things change. My mind changes. My heart changes. My actions change. But we also have to understand that there's demonic forces in the background, okay? So we don't want to open ourselves up to every spiritual thing. Well, uh, I'm very spiritual, Pastor. I'm well, that could mean a lot of things. That could mean you, you look at the horoscope, you read tarot cards, you consult, you know, it could mean a zillion things is what spiritual means. So when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, okay, we have to understand that there's a, there's a godly spirit, there's a holy spirit, there's also demonic spirits, and there's our fleshly spirit, okay? So God is like saying, as, as we look at this verse, we're going to need to test that. The, the, the Bible says this in Ephesians 6, 12, okay? It says this, for we are not fighting, and that word in, in Greek is pole, and that literally means struggling, it means wrestling, like, like have you ever seen Greco-Roman wrestling, you know, the two guys, and they're like fighting, you know, rah. it means one-on-one, -on -one. we are not wrestling, pole, against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places, so there are I don't even know how to say this right. Spiritual pushes and nudges that are, are moving people and things in, a, in, in different directions. God is, is leading us in one way, but the enemy is trying to push us and drive us away from God. Does that make sense? Okay. So when I read some verses, um, 
in the Bible, uh, there are some that are, are super duper encouraging and they're easy. And I like those. Uh, then there's some that kind of are like a little more difficult. Do you know what I'm saying? Like when we dig into the Word of God, okay, uh, every, I shouldn't say everybody, that's not true. A lot of folks and a lot of churches stay right here on the surface. Right now, this is like Christianity, and Christianity is miles wide, but about a half an inch deep. It scares me. There's no depth. Like, like they don't, we, a lot of us don't, we don't even know what we don't know yet. A lot of Christians have followed the Lord for, uh, uh, gone to church for a long time. They've never even read the New Testament one time for themselves, let alone the whole Bible. Okay, and I'm not saying that to condemn you, so don't take it. But if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, saying, gosh, that's me. Do you know what? We'll give you a devotional here. I've got a couple of them right here every week. You know what? Come grab it. Easy to understand language. The New Century Version is easy to understand. You'll have it read in a year. Okay, with great notes from, from other Christian leaders like Billy Graham, Beth Moore, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but when we dig into the Word of God, it says some tough things that we also have to realize. And, and you may not like this, I may not like this, but this is what the Word says. Okay, so as we dig a little bit deeper, uh, Matthew 24 and 9 says, uh, then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Wow. That's a, that's a difficult verse, don't you think? But is that a truthful verse? Yes. Is that something that we need to understand? Yes. Absolutely. And many false prophets, the Bible says, will appear and deceive many people. Matthew 24, 11. Now that's not, you don't see that on a bumper sticker, do you? Yet it's a truth of the Bible, right? Yes. We have to realize it. It's a truth. Here's another one. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most people on the planet is going to grow cold. They're not going to care. They're just going to think about themselves. That's not a fun verse. Here's another one. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. Matthew 24, 24. Here's, here's another. In fact, the time is coming when everyone, who this is a doozy, who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. <whistles> Imagine if they start calling Christians haters. Whoa. They already are, you say, some people? Yeah. You know what? I never thought I'd see the day, but yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Things are being twisted around. Kind of funny in a not really funny way. But this is what it says. So um, it, this is not easy to believe them. These things are, are in the scripture. And then here's another one in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For his time is coming, and I think is now here, when people won't endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. What do I want to do? I want a church that blesses me. I want a church that I I want to I want to. What's my passion? I want them to. I want to be able to live however I want in this area and follow. God. I want instead of God. What do you want? And then listen, like we read in here in First John. Chapter, hello. Okay. First John chapter 4. You know, here, here's one more that, that I really don't like. And my wife hates the scripture picture, but I think it's appropriate. Okay? Listen. So the Holy Spirit clearly tells us that in the last days, some will turn from the true faith. And they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Well, Pastor, I brought a friend. What are you doing? 
you're making them uncomfortable. Somebody just said telling the truth. You're right. That's exactly what I'm doing. Listen, I'm responsible for God. Now listen, if the seats fill up, fantastic. If the church gets bigger, fantastic. If it doesn't, all I know is fantastic. We're going to teach the Word of God just like it says. And if people, for whoever wants to hear, if there's two people or 2,002 people, we're going to share the Word of God. Okay? And hear it, not hear it, that's up to you between you and the Lord. But I have to be responsible for, for God. Okay? And what we're seeing in so many churches is they're telling people what their itching ears want to hear. And you know what? It's keeping them in bondage. It's, it's more of, of a show. We'll get to that in a little bit. But they're following. There's a power behind, uh, uh, you know, hey, you know, a perspective behind, well, we want to fill the seeds. Yeah, we want to get the money. We want to get the blah, 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 blah. Forget that. What does God's word say? Listen, <laughs> the Bible even says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 13 to 14, for such people, you know, whatever these pastors, they're false apostles, they're deceitful workers. That, those are harsh words. And they're masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And then it says, it's not surprising, this is in 2 Corinthians 11, 15, it's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. But their end will be what their actions deserve. They're not going to have a barcode on their head that says, you know, false teacher. They're not going to do that. It, it, it's not going to be that apparent. I, I, I really like um, what Chuck Swindoll said here. And, uh, and so I, I'm, it says, the fact is, and this is about this verse particularly. Um, in fact, I'm going to, I just want to, yeah, I'm going to take one second. Lord, how do you want me to do this? Yeah, I'm going to read it. 1 John chapter 1, verse, excuse me, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. The Apostle John tells us, he's dear friends, beloved, number one, here you go, he's telling you, Christian, believer in Jesus Christ, do not believe every spirit, right? Number one, the Greek word there for spirit is pneuma, and, and basically that just means breath or wind. It means an influence. Um, uh, yeah, it basically it, it, it means an influence. So don't, so there's an influence, whether it's a godly influence by the Holy Spirit or a fleshly influence where it's carnal, where I want people to, to praise me or, or, or if it's a demonic influence, there's something influencing us. And, and it's the most important thing. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and Chuck said this. He said, the fact is that every human teacher, <laughs> whether true or false in their teachings, is motivated and empowered by something that is often hidden behind the scenes. And that's that spirit that we're talking about, that, that, that pneuma, all right? That... He says this, he says, this may be a spirit of wickedness, falsehood, self-interest, and carnality, or a spirit of righteousness, truth, love, holiness. He goes on to say, ultimately, we know that teachers blown about by the winds of air are under the influence of satanic deception, whether they know it or not. And teachers driven by winds of truth are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Listen, folks, uh, it matters who you listen to. It matters what, don't just go on YouTube and listen to anything or anybody. That is so dumb. I'll just listen to this guy. I'll just, man, we have to be making sure that who we're listening to, what we're listening to, has the right motivations, right? Or they're going to lead you off course, whether it's me or someone else. Does that make sense? The heart has to be right before the Lord, right? He wants pure hands, clean hands and a pure heart, right? Okay, so we have to be that same way. So it says, dear friends, don't believe every spirit. Don't believe, and in this particular context, I would say, you know, every human pastor or preacher or teacher that's out there. He says, but instead, number two, don't believe every spirit. Number two, he says, test the spirits to see whether these prophets have, uh, because many false prophets have gone to work. So the second thing is to test. And, and this is a, a, another interesting word. 
Um, my kids, my kids went to, uh, two of my kids anyway, Elijah and Nehemiah, went to a forging class. You guys ever watch, uh, oh, yeah. what's it called? Forge and Fire. Forge and Fire. Yeah. You guys, well, I don't know if you ever watched that show. Yeah. It's on Netflix. Anyway, you should. It's really good. Anyway, what they do is they take metal and they put it in, you know, fire and they hammer it out right and they... And they and they and then you know you just put it in oil or water and they you know hammer it some more they heat it up they twist it they grind it whatever to make knives or whatever and that word test when it says in our Bibles in First John chapter four verse one test the spirit the word that it uses right here dokamazo okay it means to approve to discern it means to examine it means to prove to test to scrutinize which I guess just means like to look closely to see whether something is genuine or not like as in metals like you could work with those metals and, and you might work, and as you're putting it in the fire, and, and you're examining it, and you're grinding it, and you're hammering, you might realize there's a lot of impurities. And you know what? It, it's not going to work, and you have to throw it away. You might realize that as it's being tested in the fire, and it's being on that anvil, that you know what? It's not the real, there's, two, there's stress fractures. And, it, it, and you know what? If you actually use it, if you remember in those cut tests, right? It'll break. It, it's not real. It, 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 it's... So it has to be tested. So God is telling not just for pastors to do that. He's telling you to do that. He's telling me to do that. He's telling us to do that. He's like, you need to test and approve what's good. It's important. You need to recognize what's genuine. Okay? And so... Um, when he's saying test the spirits, that's what he's talking about. It's the same word, um, that, that same word, uh, uh, dokamazo, test, is when we say in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when God says to us, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. He says, test yourself, and that's the same word. Examine, scrutinize. Listen, this isn't something you don't want me just chewing up food for you and then you go home and the rest of the week you don't crack your Bible. You don't listen to any good teaching. If you want to listen to good teaching, can I tell you, I've got multiple teachers that I know are solid. Not perfect, but solid. And I will put them into your hands. You can listen to any book of the Bible, any chapter of the Bible, any verse, any time. You can listen to us online. If... if but, but the bottom line is I know others. We're not the only, you know, uh, pastor in town that's got the corner on the truth. But it's important who you listen to, okay? The Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. He says to Christians, test all things. Don't just accept it. Test all things and then hold fast to what's good. It's, it's so important for us to do that. I look at what people look for in leaders and pastors and today, and, and to be honest, uh, they usually want somebody who's, you know, char uh, you won't use the word charismatic because that might have the wrong word, uh, a dynamic speaker. They might, somebody who, who's, who's got dressed to the nines, you know what I'm saying? Like the suit, he's got the nice suit, or maybe eloquent speech, which obviously you don't have here. Um, or the degrees behind their name. Yes, you can call me Dr. Pastor <laughs> Shettlebauer. Don't call, me, don't call me PD, Pastor D. You need to call me Dr. What? Those things are really ultimately unimportant. God always, man looks at the outside. And you know what? People are impressed with that. They are. But man looks at the outside. Mankind, I mean. But God says, I look to your heart. I look to the heart of the person, okay? So we need to change the way we look at things and look to the heart. When I look at the characteristics in the Bible for an elder or a pastor, if you'll notice, only one of them has to do with teaching. All the rest of them have to do with the character of a person. But you know what? Most churches, what they all function on is they got an A-type personality. Are they going to get stuff done? Can they bring in big donors? Can they, and there's a whole lit. Are they a good teacher? Are they eloquent? Are, do they look? There's a million other things that folks look for because that's, and it fills the seats. But that's not godly. 
We have to be looking. God is always concerned, always, with our heart first. Listen, it says in Jeremiah 17.10, But I, the Lord, I search all hearts and I examine those secret motives. I give all people their two rewards according to what their actions deserve. Everything that you do, everything that you say is going to flow from your heart. So where are you getting that information where are you are you getting uh, that inspiration if you will the bible says in luke chapter 6:45 in the new living translation it says a good person and, and by a good person, I mean oh, you can only be good but filled with the Holy Spirit, right? There's no one good but God, right? So a good person, a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit, produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person is going to produce evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say, or I'll say do, based on the last scripture, what you say or do flows from your heart. Excuse me, flows from what is in your heart. So, you know, are you getting filled? Where are you getting that treasury from? Are you taking time to read the word? Are you taking time to hide it? It's important. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, it says to guard your heart above all else, okay? Because everything you do flows from it. And if that's not centered on God's heart and God's word and God's spirit, you're going to fall for anything. You will. You can think you're... I had somebody over at my house uh, last week and they said they thought they were Mr. or Miss Good Christian and they knew the Bible and they and they started realizing when they started and, and all these years and they started reading the Bible for themselves and finding out what it said for themselves. And they were like, wow, this, this says so much. I didn't realize this is way different. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we need to guard our heart from these things. Listen, when it talks about testing, he tests the spirits. It's important. Listen to this, okay? I, I'm going to ask you, Chris, would you hit the light for this one? Because yeah. I want this picture embedded into your brain, okay? I use these scripture pictures for, to me, when the Lord gives me this, I want it, it's a good representation, okay? The Bible says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, all the, the world, most of the church, they're all going to go one direction. That's a broad road. Everybody's going to be following it. Do not conform to the pattern, the mold of this world, but be transformed by the what? Of your mind. And you notice that those dark thing, tentacles are trying to grab her. Did you notice that? You notice it's all dark on this side? You notice it's all bright over here? And what is she reaching for? It's a light source. It is a light source. It's more than that even. It'll be a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. Every step you take. She's reaching for it. But, but everybody focuses on this. But can I tell you, there's another part to this verse. Listen. Listen to me. Then, it says, then you will be able to what? Test. Test. Approve. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing will. Listen, if you're not renewing your mind with God's word, you're not going to be able to test. First, you have to get this in your head and in your heart. Then you will be able to test and approve. Does that make sense? If you're not doing that, you're not going to you're going to be blown around by every wind of doctrine. You're not going to know the difference. And that's what I'm seeing in so many Christians. I I feel like ah somebody listen to me. Somebody listen to me. This is important. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then and only then will you be able to test and approve what God's will is. Does that make sense? God's saying test the spirits. If you don't do that, you won't. And so many churches are going that direction. It's, it's mind-boggling. Isaiah said this all the way back in Isaiah. He says, look to God's instructions and teaching. This is in Isaiah chapter 8. He says, people who contradict his word are completely in the dark. 
completely. I, I want to read to you something that um, this is from a, one of the few large, um, is an internationally known pastor. I'm not going to use his name. But I, this is from his journal, and I, I had my wife copy it, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to read it to you, okay? So just listen, okay? This is from uh, a godly man who's lived for many years, and a, and a preacher and a teacher of God's Word. I've lived long enough, this is what he said, to watch an alarming erosion occur in modern Christianity. The church I entered, back, I'll just say, in the day, he gives a date, but... Uh, is not the same church as today. He says, large influential churches are looking more and more like they got their genes crossed with Wall Street and Broadway. A strange mutation of techniques from corporate America and show business have replaced or at least watered down the sound and systematic teaching of the Word of God. They are there are notable exceptions for which I'm grateful, but that's the tragedy. They are exceptions, not the rule. He said, instead of offering meat, which solid meat of God's word is what he means, based on sound doctrines, our houses of worship have turned into the baby food of the world of entertainment. A consumer mentality is now acceptable substitute for theological thinking and understanding the Bible. Naive and impressionable infants in their faith gather to hear what they want to hear from preachers and teachers who are often not much better than their hearers. When I consider these developments, I can't help but think of Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, which says, you're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teachings, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. It seems like, he says, it seems like pastors today will stop at nothing to entertain their audience. And I say, not their congregation, their audience. And those audiences want nothing more than to hear things that tickle their fancy. I don't know. Now, some of you might hear that and go, oh, sounds like a grumpy old preacher dude. Or you might understand that this is a guy that's pleading for people to listen. Now, some of you in here are listening to what's being said to you. Some of you in here are just saying, whatever. Listen, I'm, I plead with you in the name of Jesus Christ to hear what's being said. It, it goes on to say in 1 John chapter 4, uh, actually verse 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not from God, because it says many false prophets have gone into the world. It, imagine, and this was back in the Apostle John's day, they've only increased in, in, uh, uh, in power, in proficiency, in, in how they do things, in their number. I couldn't think of another word that starts with P, but you get the idea. Prevalence. What? Prevalence. Prevalence. Oh, where were you when I was... <laughs> Prevalence, power, proficiency. Thank you. That's good. He, he, he goes on to say... And, and listen, I just, just so you don't... Just in case those of you don't know, I love this picture. Uh, in 2 John, it says this. It says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. This, this is a deceiver and an antichrist, okay? They're wolves among sheep. This is 2 John chapter 7. Uh, last week I said something. I just want to know if everybody understood. I said, man, I was driving this point home, and then I thought, I wonder if people don't even understand what I'm saying. Not in a mean way. I just tend to think, oh, everybody knows what I'm talking about, and, and that's not always the case. I said, hey, we need to really be Bereans. Yep. Now, can you just, how many understand completely what I'm saying when I say we need to be Bereans? Can I just have you raise your hand? Okay, only about a quarter of you. Okay. Okay, listen. This is, this is what the Bible says in Acts 17.11. Paul was preaching the gospel, and he, and he said this. He said about the, the Bereans, 
He said, now the Berean Jew, Jews were of more noble character than those who he's preaching to in Thessalonica. He said, for they received the message, the gospel, the Bible, with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures. How often? Every day. To see if what Paul said was true. Look it up. You know, listen, I, I, I have some people say some wonderful things about the teaching here, and I'm so thankful that you do. It's really encouraging. But you know what? I, I, I'm not going to, don't believe me. Go back, examine to see what I'm saying is true. Because people, we're all like sheep. We go astray. We want to follow a people or a denomination or a church or whatever. Examine the scriptures every day. Every day, renew your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is. You'll be able to test the spirits. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so when I say be a Berean, it means receive the message just like you're doing today. Thank you for that. You're here. That says some wonderful things about you, you know, if you're listening. <laughs> That God is, the word is going forth. You're receiving it. Thank you, Lord, for that. But you know what? Go back. Examine it every day. See if what's being said is true. Does that make sense, everybody? And I don't care if you're here for one day or, or 100 years. This is what you do. Capiche? Capiche. All right, would you bring the microphone back? And uh, so we're cruising right along. Thank you so much. How long have I been teaching? We're in verse 1. How long? Make it quick, Mark. I got to speak. I got to put the pedal to the metal. Okay. Well, I want to I want to back up. Oh. When you uh, last year yes. were in the middle of a one it looked like it was a one year test. Health issues, life threatening yeah. stuff. Yes, sir. It was not easy. It was not pleasant. And you know what? I've been through a lot of tests and trials myself, and they're not. But how did you get through and not give up? Uh, how long do you have? <laughs> as long as it takes, because we're all there. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm just praying and I'm asking the Lord if he wants me to answer that now or later. I, I, I am going to answer that question, Lord willing, but I'm going to answer that later. Part of it came, I'll just say in short, is because of all that God did beforehand as I'm hiding his word in my heart, right? Because there were times where I had nothing left and the Lord would actually bring back, he actually did this, I'll never forget it, on a gurney, wheeling me down. I didn't have hardly had enough energy to get out, just even move from the gurney. I could just roll barely. And, and, and he actually brought back my own teachings in the word to remind me. I thought, oh God, my own teachings, really, Lord? <laughs> you know? But he'll bring those things back up because the... I've made him a part of who I am. Does that make sense? You have to apply it. I have to apply it. We have to receive it. Does... Capiche? Listen, I am going to talk about that more because that's a super important question, Mark. Yeah. You did awesome. And he goes on to say in verse 2, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges, or some of your translations will say confess, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Okay, and I guess three goes with it, but every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is, excuse me, does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, uh, and now... And even now is already here. Okay, so that word, you see it says every spirit that acknowledges or confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Well, that word, um, whether it says acknowledge or confess, I, I don't know if, if I've say, I can say this right. The word in Greek is homolo, uh, excuse me, homologeo, and it basically means to agree with. It means to declare openly. It means to promise. It means to profess 
worship of. So when it says, like I read that, oh, everybody who acknowledges that Jesus Christ came, oh, yeah, Jesus Christ came, we're good. Yeah, he's my homeboy. Peace out, Jesus, right? That's good. Oh, I confess him, right? Confess him about Jesus Lord. And I believe in heart, God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. Oh, okay, Jesus Lord, saved. No, the, the homile, homileo means like uh, I'm promising myself. It's I'm openly declaring. It's like I, I, I'm, I'm worship. This is who I'm choosing to, to grab onto. So if, if, if anyone who confesses Jesus, it, it's not a what, it's a who. So he's like anybody who denies this Jesus. And when I say Jesus, I mean the word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It says we've seen his glory, the one and only glory of the Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. I mean everything. I mean the virgin birth. I, I mean the miracles, right? I, I mean the dying on the cross for our sins, the blood he shed, right? I mean the resurrection from the dead. I mean the whole shebang, all that the Bible says about Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not something we pick and choose what we want. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes. Matthew 1, 23 says this. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and he shall be called his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay? Now back in... in, in uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of people were like, Pastor, Pastor, I believe in God, or my boyfriend believes in God, or, you know, God bless America, I live in America, right? God, 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 right? Isn't that good? Let me just be blunt. And, and if you brought somebody here, you're thinking, oh, my goodness, what is he going to say now? Well, listen, <laughs> here's what the Bible said in James. Okay, I don't know if I put the verse, I, I did, you can't see it up, it's up in the corner, I put it up there. James 2, 19, uh, it might be 17. I might have put the wrong verse. Is it 219? Yeah. So Mark, would you look that up? Make sure it's in 219 or 217. But anyway, it says, you believe there is one God, the Bible says? Good. Now, I'm going to translate this into the Darren Shettlebauer paraphrase version, okay? Pastor D's paraphrase. You believe there's one God? whoop de dang do. Let's read what the rest of it says. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You believe there's one God? So do the demons. You know, they even have to submit to him. Did you know that? They know who he is. The problem is they don't willingly submit themselves to his leadership in their life. Does that make sense? They actually reject it. Like a lot of us do. So when we confess, when we profess the name Jesus Christ, we're taking the whole package. Okay? Listen, the Bible says, well, I, I, I just believe in the Father, you know. The Bible says this. The Bible says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Wow. Soinkaramas. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, 23. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I, I like what Dave Guzik, my friend Dave Guzik said. He said about this verse. He said, today, some groups deny that Jesus is really God, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Mormons, Muslims, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, so the cults, other religions. But way back in... in and the Jews, it goes on. But way back in John's day, uh, in his time, the time closest to the actual life and ministry of Jesus on this earth, people didn't have a hard time believing Jesus was God. They had a hard time believing that he was a real man. They believed he was almost like a phantom or a ghost because he was too holy. He wouldn't have actually lowered himself to come down and talk to us and walk with us and teach us and to become one of us but he did do exactly that because he loves us. Anyway, he says, the false teaching says Jesus uh, was truly God, which is correct, but really only a make-believe man. And that's what they believed back in that day. It goes on to say in verse 4, and I'm speeding it up for time's sake, he says, 
Listen, you're, you dear children, you though, in contrast to them, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. Look at that. Verse 4, if you don't, you better underline, highlight. I shouldn't say you better, it's not threatening. You should highlight, underline. You dear children are from God and have overcome them. All those false prophets, false spirits, false deceivers. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now listen, I've done some diving. Does anybody have any diving, any divers here? When I say, I mean scuba divers. Okay, well, only like three of us, four, okay. So, uh, so basically I, I've div dove different places and one time I trench dive, it was the scariest thing I've ever done in Cozumel. It was a cliff, it was like a thousand feet down. It was just one of the scariest moments of my life. My BC, my, uh, my little uh, gauge that tells me how deep I am broke. And, and it was so, I was so, I didn't know where, I was alone. The current took me over this, tr over this trench and it was a thousand or 1500 feet and it was nothing but darkness above and Cozumel you can see for a long time and nothing but darkness below. And my, and my, my thing in my uh, uh, regulator, whatever, was, I, it was broke. I wanted to, sh I was so scared, I wanted to shoot to the surface, but if you do that, you know what, you could die. You could get the bends, right? Uh, for those of you who know what that is, air bubbles, because there's different pressures, right? Well, that's nothing compared to the Marianas Trench. Has anybody ever heard of that? Okay, that's a place off the coast of Japan and the Philippines. It's basically the deepest place on the planet. Okay, it, 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 it actually goes down, you know how I said that trench was like 1,500, it goes down at the deepest spot at Challenger Deep, this is the trench right here, okay, it goes down 36,000 feet, seven miles down, okay, seven miles down. It, it just hypothetically, if you put Mount Everest at the bottom there, okay, at that trench, it's 43 miles wide and 1,500 miles or something like that I've ever written down. Long, if you put Mount Everest down there, it would still be a mile or two below the ocean. That's how deep it goes, okay? Okay, Pastor, why are you telling me all this? Wait, just work with me here. This is Victor Vescovo, and he's an American businessman. He was in the Navy for 20 years, intelligence officer. Anyway, he dove all the five oceans, and, and, and his greatest feat was diving to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, okay? And he did that as a picture of him there. He dove in this thing. And this was a, a special sub built four years in the making with the newest technology in a special spherical way with four inch thick titanium plating built in a special spherical way to handle the pressure. The pressure when you go down all the way to the bottom is so intense it's 15,000 pounds of square of pressure per square inch. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? 15,000 for every inch, that's the pressure that it's under. Is that incredible? Now, you know what else is under there in this specially built thing? This thing. I don't know if you can see the sheen of it. This is a little delicate fish. I could take my little finger and I could push right through it. You, I don't know if you can see it, really. It, now this delicate creature, it's called a snailfish, and, and it swims happily at the bottom of Mariana's Trench. Okay, under all that pressure. Pastor, where are you going with this? What's, the point I'm trying to make is, and, and this goes back to your question, Mark. You said, how do I handle all those things? And, and this, is, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Somehow, I, and I read up on this fish, don't ask me why, I just did. I still can't explain it, but the bottom line is, I read multiple articles, somehow the internal workings, the DNA of this fish was been changed so that uh, the fatties of this, the that, the blah, 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 it's been changed so that internally, the pressure inside of it, right, can withstand the power and the pressure is greater than that 15,000 pounds per square inch. Somehow, it's been changed to do that. The point that I'm trying to make, and if you didn't follow me, God says, dear children, you have overcome all these false teachers. All the, I, It's more prevalent now than I've ever seen. It actually blows me away. Okay? You have overcome them, and here's why. 
because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. What I'm saying to you and what Mark, in answer to your question is, because I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, it doesn't matter what pressure is on me, okay? It, it, it might be so much, but you know what? I have a greater force within me. I have the person of the Holy Spirit that's greater than anything this world can throw at me. Pastor, Pastor, you, I get this all the time in counseling. Pastor, and I don't say this like lightly. You don't understand my wife. <laughs> You, oh, you don't understand my husband. You don't understand how I'm gripped by fear. You don't understand my anxiety levels. I can't come to church. You don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. There's so much. And there's always something that I don't understand. And this is what I want to say super lovingly, not in a condemning way or an arrogant way. I, I want to say, you know what, friend? You don't understand not being mean but greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world the bible says listen just like that snailfish or whatever I don't know if it's just like it but if anyone is in Christ they're a new creation the old is gone and the new is come it doesn't matter what pressure you're under. If you're trusting in Christ and you're trusting in the word, it doesn't matter what comes your way. You're holding on to him. You're not trusting in yourself. You're not trusting even in your own abilities. You're trusting in his great and precious promises whom he says he's given you everything to get through this life. Everything. Do you believe it? Not being mean. Do you hold on to it personally? Is it yours? Do you understand that? Listen, the Bible says everybody knows these things in their head, but not in their hearts. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Yeah, kick it. Woo! Right? But then something comes up in their life, and I'm like, oh, yeah. listen, you are not just a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror, because greater is you than you than he is in the world. Listen, <laughs> you may feel like this guy. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit within you and your trust in Jesus and your trust in the word of God, it empowers you. For I can do some things, all things, everything. This is in the Living Bible. But it says, for I can do everything God asked me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and the power. Amen? Amen. I'm just going to read the last two verses and we're done. Sorry, I know, I'm sorry, please, please bear with me. Okay, hear me out here. The last few verses, it says, They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. That's verse 5. Listen, I'm all for getting to the world, and, and, but if you have to compromise to do it, it's not worth it. So what if the churches are filled? So what? Because you're hip, you're relevant, oh, I smoke this, so I drink this, so that makes me cool, and then they listen to me more, and I compromise this way, I sleep with my... Listen, don't do that. You can be loving, kind, but you don't need to compromise the word of God to do it. You trust him because greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. Just because people are listening to you doesn't mean that God is working through you. Listen, the Bible says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Okay, 1 John chapter 2, 15. The world and its desires are going to pass away. It's all going to burn, baby. But the one who does the will of God is going to live how long? Forever. Jesus told a bunch of the folks there, he said, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. The world's going to listen to you. Listen, I want to be loving, I want to be kind, but I want to speak the truth. And then this last verse here. It says, If you belong to the world, it would love you as your own. As it is, you don't belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of this world. And that's why the world hates you. That's not a fun scripture. I get it. Okay? You won't put that on a t-shirt. Right? Hey, the world hates me. <laughs> Yet you have to realize that's part of the deal. Capiche? That last verse just says this. 
But we are from God, and whoever li knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and falsehood. So we recognize the spirit of truth versus the spirit of falsehood by renewing our minds with the word of God. Then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Does that make sense? We also test it by, by receiving who God says Jesus is, who Jesus says he is, right? The whole kit and caboodle. We don't pick and choose what we want to believe from his word or what Jesus says about himself. Does that make sense? Capiche? You do that and you'll be square. And you remember, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Everybody understood? Let's pray. Father, I want to say thank you. Lord, I know, uh, Lord, I might be a little discombobulated today, Lord, but I pray that your message for your people got through clearly and powerfully, Lord. Because your word, you promise, does not return void. So my hope is not in myself or in my words. My hope is in your word, Lord God. So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that something would prick in a heart, Lord God, something would be stirred in a spirit to want more of your word, Lord God, to want that whole counsel of God, Lord God, that you would heat them up to want to know more of what the word says for themselves, Lord, not what other people says it means or what their daddy's daddy's daddy said it means, but what you say it means, Lord God. So help each one of us to be drawn to your word, to be drawn to who you are, to receive you, Jesus, fully, Lord, and to receive what your word says completely, trusting in you in every situation, Lord God, no matter how much pressure is on us. We love you. We bless you, and I ask that you bless this congregation, Lord, the ones that are here today, the ones that are listening from home, Lord, because of, of corona, Lord, and the, and the ones that watch it later in the week and that are not here today, Lord. In Jesus' name, will you empower them? Would you give them a greater understanding of the reality of who you are in them, Lord, so that you can work through them in the fullest of power? We ask this, and I ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's God's people together said, amen, amen, amen and amen.